I'm Jim Stigler uh, as part of Startup UCLA. And we're really excited to, at the last minute, have gotten Stuart also up to agree to come and speak to us uh, or do his stand-up routine or something like that. And Stuart is just um, a really interesting guy. Uh, mainly Jim, because, Jim's really interesting too. So. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, you want to introduce me first? Okay. <laughs> um, but Stuart's one of those rare people in Silicon Valley who's both done it and then also has a gift for storytelling and reporting and telling about what's happening in Silicon Valley. And his career, he's been very successful at both. So he's currently a partner at Alsa Louis. Uh, partners that he started in 2006, I think. With a guy named Louie. With a guy named Louie, yeah. He's kind of probably going to guess that. Before that, he spent 10 years at another venture firm, New Enterprise Associates, where he uh, worked on funding of, uh, of companies like TiVo and Portola Communications, NetCentives, Glue, Mobile, Xfire, um, Justin TV, I guess that's a... All that's all Sap Louie, yeah. All Louis company. Um, but he's also been the editor-in-chief of InfoWorld um, for about 10 years. He was a columnist at Fortune, uh, wrote a very interesting column. And uh, a long time ago, before most of us were born, he was the executive editor of Inc. Magazine. Not before he was born. No, not before I was born. <laughs> anyway, so let's welcome Stuart uh, also. Thank you. So I was let, you know, I use uh, this and that. And they're all Apple stuff, and they're supposed to stream photos. But I took this picture, which you can't see because it's too small. Uh, this is over at CNSI. Is that where the picture is? Yeah. Uh, lost track. And it says wanted for CNSI, VCs for CNSI. And it has a picture of me holding a machine gun. It's actually a plastic machine gun. But I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, anyway, I don't have an organized talk. Well, I do have an organized talk, but uh, it's not really a talk. It's not because you guys go to school. You probably think uh, it's like more like a lecture. Well, I don't do lectures. I went to school and I got out as fast as I could and I never looked back. That was 40 years ago. Uh, I graduated from Occidental College right here in Los Angeles, which is promoting itself as 125 years old, um, a real institution. Um, and uh, so I, I showed up at the last minute and you guys uh, organized this thing. So I'm gonna say some things and then see whether you guys wanna participate or whether I have to fill up the whole time myself. Um, so I, I'm an old guy. If you hadn't noticed that, I'm old. Uh, I've been in the tech business for 35 years. Um, as mentioned, I worked at Inc. Magazine and I wrote an article about Steve Jobs and Apple and two guys named Dan Bricklin and Bob Frankston from uh, 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 a little company called uh, Software Arts, which built the first spreadsheet on a PC. And uh, that was my introduction and that was back in 19, uh, a long time ago. Um, <coughs> and. Uh, and I moved to, from Boston to Silicon Valley uh, 30 years ago, almost exactly 30 years ago, and, and I've been living in Sil Silicon Valley and now San Francisco for the past 30 years. So, and I've been a VC for the last 16 years. So I have these two kind of experiences, being a reporter and covering technology and uh, being a VC. And they're really broken into the two major technology shifts that have happened over the last 40 years, 30 years, which is that I became involved in the personal computer business when it started to happen. Uh, I found the Apple II and I went, whoa, look at this, a whole computer. Uh, I didn't even know what a computer was and I, didn't, I actually asked somebody at that time, what's the difference between hardware and software? And they couldn't answer the question. It's really hard. The line is kind of fuzzy. Um, so now, 30 years later, I can tell you the difference between hardware and software, but you won't understand what I'm saying. Um, and then when I became a venture capitalist in 1996, I participated in the internet thing. So, you know, I've been fortunate, it's like, you know, I just got plunked on this earth at a particular time uh, when I got to participate in these two major shifts in technology. And there were other ones before and there will be other ones afterwards, but during my lifetime I got to participate in these two. And uh, so, uh, so that's what I am. Uh, that's what I've done. So, and I can talk about anything, but I, I kind of want to find out who, who's in the room. Um, and because uh, I have this impression that UCLA, everybody either wants to make a film or be a doctor. And uh, so I'm kind of wondering, is, am I right about that? I mean, anybody want to be a doctor in the room or anybody want to make a film? Okay, so, well, you do. You want to make a film? You're not sure about that? Yeah. I okay. actually switched from pre-med to wanting to make a film. Oh, yeah, so you're, you qualify. Okay, we have one person who qualifies for both. So that's good. <laughs> Talk to me afterwards. But uh, so. Uh, uh, and uh, so how many of you are, uh, have an engineering, uh, you're in an engineering program? 
uh, just about a third, okay? And uh, how many are in some kind of business-related program? How many are not students? Okay, that covered the whole thing. That's pretty good. Uh, we kind of have the right audience. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a choice, and it's, a, it's like a multiple choice question. Uh, you probably had those before. I assume you had to take tests. I did. I haven't done it for 40 years, but uh, I assume they're still testing kind of like they tested me. The I'm sorry? Can we choose all of the above? Uh, well, we'll have to see because we're time constrained here, and I think I have to be out of here at a particular time. I'm happy to entertain you as long as I can. But uh, So there's three things I can do. Um, I can trace a deal. Uh, an investment that I've made. It's a company called Digit, D-I-J-I-T. If you have an iPad, you can download its app. It's called NextGuide. Uh, it's in the television space. That's option number one. Uh, I can give you the pitch for our fundraising. Uh, without being able to project it, I'd have to do it on my little iPad here and kind of wander around and show it to you. But, the, uh, but it's, uh, I can tell you how we raise money by actually trying to raise money from you. Um, and uh, that might be interesting. Uh, or I can tell you about the company that was born. I don't know if I can say that it was born here. Um, was Wave, uh, Wave Connects was not really born here, but we discovered it in the lab. We say that we discovered it here in the lab. And actually, part of the reason I'm here is to go take a tour of the lab and find out if that's actually what we did. But uh, you, you hooked them up. It did, it did come out of the engineering lab. Out of the engineering lab. They were using it to do spins on a chip. It's a chip company. And so for a little venture capital firm to have a chip company in its portfolio is very unusual. And so we have been benefited from this uh, connection that I guess you made specifically um, to, uh, between uh, my partner, Gim and Louie, the Louie and Alsop Louie, and uh, this company called WaveConnects, which uh, uh, just closed a round of funding and we believe will be a major disruptor in the connector business and be worth billions of dollars anyway. So those are your three choices. Digit, our fund, or WaveConnects. Let's see, number one, Digit. Gilman, Gilman did tell you about the 5% deal that we have, right? Uh, uh, you know, I say that working with venture capitalists is a lot like working with car salesmen. <laughs> we know much more about this than you do. <laughs> so you thought you were getting 5%, but... <laughs> okay, anybody vote for Digit? This is in the television industry. Not looking like anybody's... Okay, you like that. Talk to me afterwards. Uh, give my pitch for the fund. See how a venture capitalist raise money. Okay, it's going to be hard to... Okay, WaveConnects is part of that, so you get, you get two out of three. <laughs> okay, I'm going to bring the pitch up here. And I'm going to do this a little fast, because uh, normally we spend an hour and a half doing this, and I don't think I have that much time. Um, but I do do it on an iPad. I do it like this. and So I walk into a room, usually some kind of a uh, wood paneled room uh, in, a, in, a, in a very institutional kind of office um, with people that are usually wearing coats and ties and uh, they manage lots of million, you know, billions of dollars of money and what we're doing is trying to get them to give us 10 or 20 million <coughs> and I hold up the iPad and they look at it and they go, what's that? <laughs> so that's the first problem we have when we're pitching our fund is that we're pitching it to people that have no concept what we do for a living uh, either as a venture capitalist or the companies that we invest in. So I have this very polite title on this slide, and I'll read the whole thing to you, but it's, uh, as I go through the presentation, it says, Technology Cycles Create Opportunity. And depending on who it is and whether they have like a sense of humor or not, I say, well, what this really means is bubbles are us. And uh, so we're venture capitalists, and one of the true things about venture capital that's proven over 40 years or more is that venture capitalists make money in bubbles. So when everybody gets really excited about a technology, say like social media, say like Facebook or Groupon and Zynga before they screwed up, uh, and other companies, uh, people get really excited about it. The shares go up, and you, the venture capitalists who invested in those companies make a lot of money. So if you're a venture capitalist and you're smart, you actually try to figure out when the bubble is going to happen, invest before the bubble, and participate in the whole increase in valuation. That's how you make money for your investors. So, this is a polite way of saying bubbles are us. And so if we're pitching to somebody who's got like a sense of humor, I say that. Otherwise, I go through the whole polite thing of, well, you know, these technology cycles happen and blah, blah, blah. So <clears throat> what we say about ourselves is that Gelman and myself, we're old farts and been in the business for more than 30 years. And what we're really good at is forecasting. So if you hook it up with what I just said, we're really good at predicting bubbles. Um, and, uh, but, you know, you have to take this seriously, so we actually talk about technology cycles uh, and we pit use this slide to raise our last fund and it has this kind of big arrow going up to the uh, upper uh, right. 
<coughs> uh, and it goes through different technology cycles. Client server was the technology cycle that happened in the 1980s. Uh, that's when we had personal computers. IBM had endorsed computers by, uh, personal computers by making them. People were figuring out how to build what were known as local area networks and hook the computers together. And that was client-server technology. There was client on the PC, and the server was the thing at the other end of the uh, network. But it was uh, kind of crappy. It didn't work very well because everybody had different standards. And so, but it was a major step forward from what happened previously. Then the internet came along in the mid-90s, and, and I, I, even you young people who uh, may have only just been born prior to that um, know what happened, and it's called the bubble. Uh, and people refer to this as the bubble as though no other bubbles had ever happened, but in fact it was like the 10th bubble uh, in the history of the technology business, and there are bubbles going on in every industry. So the internet came along, and it, it did an amazing thing. Is it, it, restructured the technology that people used completely during that bubble. So all companies, all institutions, all networks moved on to a single protocol, the Internet Protocol, or IP. So what we said when we started talking about this three or four years ago is the Internet's been around for 15 years. It was built basically, and, and this is true, it was built basically <coughs> to survive a nuclear bomb. Uh, the idea of the Internet, the original idea of the Internet, the way it was constructed is that you drop a nuclear bomb and it wipes out everything that it wipes out, and then whatever is left over still works. Um, and that was sort of the basic underlying thesis behind the structure of the Internet protocol and the, and the network that was built on top of it. Well, that doesn't scale well. That doesn't provide reliable service. It, it doesn't work very well, actually. is kind of what it boils down to. And now we've got mobile devices and all the other stuff we're putting on this network. We need a new Internet. And so we started talking about that, and we named it the Evernet. And of course, remember, we're forecasters, and we know what's going on. So you can go out and talk to other people, people not like us, if, if you don't trust us, and you'll find out that actually is going on. And so uh, this is the new Internet that's being built. So we started talking about that, and it's actually happening. And we talked about the transition from IPv4 to IPv6, and I won't even try to explain that one to you. Uh, but that's kind of a, a defining moment in how this new Evernet is being adopted. So. Now we go move on, and we've come up with this really cool graphic. Ooh, ah, uh, <laughs> no, okay, it's not that good. Um, uh, what we're talking about is, okay, you have the Evernet, and you have the, you're rebuilding the, the the big network out there in the sky, and the thing is now scalable and reliable. You can run movies on your iPad when you're walking around downtown Westwood. Uh, you can have reliable communications. You can diagnose people's health problems. Blah blah, all this kind of stuff. Well, you have to have this cycle that happens on top of that, and it starts with trust. You have to trust the network. You have to trust that it'll work. You have to trust that if you put stuff on it, that it's going to be secure. Uh, and, then you have, and then you have insight, and insight is the opportunity that goes forward. This is where the really cool stuff is going on. Um, insight means you have a lot of data. The network's got, got all that data out there, and the data's talking to the data, and the machines are talking to the machines. <coughs> What do you do with all that stuff? And the sort of hot thing in the, in, uh, the technology industry is you know, uh, machine learning, uh, knowledge systems, uh, machines being able to figure out what you want before you know that you want it, and making recommendations to you. And uh, so trust plus insight leads to action, and that's kind of our cool little thing. We skip over that and get back into the details. Um, and I won't do that slide because that's uh, too hard to read. So I'm here to tell you. Now imagine that you're responsible for investing $100 billion. Okay, that's hard. Let's say a billion dollars. Um, that's a little more manageable. So you have a billion dollars. You have a big pool of money, and uh, you got to put it into stuff. You got to buy real estate, maybe, or you got to buy stocks or mutual funds, and uh, and you got to figure out how to get uh, return on this investment. You go to your local bank right now. You can get like 0.1% uh, a month, I think, is the current standard <coughs> interest rate. Um, which doesn't give you a whole hell of a lot. And uh, so you've got to get like 5% a year, and that's kind of what the people that have the money want you to do while you're managing this. So what I come along and do is I tell you, here, trust me, give me $10 million. And uh, what you're going to do is sign a document. You're actually not going to give me $10 million. You're going to sign a document where you're going to deliver that, to, that money to me every time I ask for it. So if I say, okay, you've got to send me $100,000, you've got to send within two weeks $100,000, and if you don't do that, you lose everything. And uh, so, and trust me, you're going to give me this money over a period of six to, to eight years, and uh, I'm not going to make any money for you for a long time, and you can't get the money back out, but you're going to make a lot of money. Trust me. So that's the basic pitch when you're doing venture capital. 
And compared to you know buying stuff in the public markets, which you can sell anytime you want, or you know stuff that isn't risky. Um, so what we're proposing is a hundred million dollar fund. Our th this will be our third fund, and uh, what we're doing is putting a hundred million on the cover. It means we have a document called a private placement memo, which we just published yesterday, um, and uh, and we're saying we're going to have a hundred million dollar fund. But then you know if people like it, we'll raise a hundred and forty million dollars. So it's capped at a hundred and forty million dollars. Won't raise any more than a hundred and forty million. And this is a way of kind of getting out there and talking to people and finding out whether they're interested in what you're proposing. And uh, in our case, uh, we're doing this with the same partners. Uh, Gilman and myself, Gilman Louie and myself, call ourselves the geek and the gadfly. Um, he's the geek, he knows everything. And I swear to God, he does. Uh, I've tested him repeatedly. He knows about brains, he knows about materials, he knows about networks and chips and everything. I, I have not been able to stump him so far. Great partner to have when you're investing in technology companies because nobody can stump him. And, uh, and I've been in some pretty remarkable conversations with him. And I'm the gadfly. I know everybody, and uh, this is true, by the way. I do know everybody. I have uh, approximately 300 million close personal friends. Um, and, uh, but if I don't know them, I can get to them. And uh, as a venture capital firm, when you have a guy who knows everything and a guy who knows everybody, you kind of cover the whole range of what you need to do to help entrepreneurs. Because uh, Gilman can tell you what to do, and I can, get it to, I can get you to the people that'll help you do it. But we're adding another one uh, in this uh, fund with this fund. So we're the geek, the gadfly, and the spook. And the spook is a guy named Bill Kroll who used to be the deputy director of the National Security Agency. The reason we're doing this is we found we're really good at investing in security companies. So uh, we have uh, repeatedly now invested in security companies and made money doing it. And uh, which is not relevant of course to WaveConnects, but unless we pitch it. Gilman actually convinced me that that's what I should be doing and that's what I'm doing now too. You're also doing security? Well, you too can be a venture partner for our firm. We'll pay you nothing and, and uh... <laughs> the imaginary five <5%. laughs> percent. So just uh, look now and see what it... Gilman, uh, the reason for this is Gilman, uh, prior to becoming my partner, was the founding CEO of something called Incutel. Uh, Incutel is a... Uh, we, I always do this because uh, it's not actually, but it's the venture capital arm of the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, well, it started out as the VC arm of the CIA, but now it's also the venture arm of the NSA, the FBI, the NGA, DHS. I know I'm missing one in there. Um, FBI. No, I said FBI. Yeah. Uh, there's another one in there anyway. But uh, we have a lot of intelligence agencies. I don't know if you knew that. but. Uh, uh, and uh, it is now the entity that figures out what to invest in to help those agencies and move their technology forward. So it's a strategic investor in, uh, on behalf of uh, the federal intelligence agencies in the United States of America. Other countries have come and tried to copy it, not to so successfully. <clears throat> so anyway, he is, uh, and we have a total of six investors in our firm. Four of the six maintain top, sec top secret security clearance. So in other words, four of our partners have at one time or another been cleared by the federal government for top secret uh, level clearance and maintain those clearances. So they know stuff. For I don't, I don't know anything actually. I just know a lot of people. Um, but I, but uh, if they were here telling you stuff, then they'd have to kill you. So and this is always fun with our potential investors. We go, oh, okay, we'd be happy to tell you about that, but then we'll have to t kill you. Um, it's not a good way to raise money. So, uh, so, and then we go on, and uh, this is our first fund. So we raised a fund for $75 million in 2006, so the fund is six years old. Um, and with that $70 million, $75 million, uh, as I said, we called it over time. We've called $71.6 million, so we have another $4.5 million left to call from our investors. We've used that $71.6 million to invest in 17 companies. Of those, seven have been realized, and realized means we got the money back or something else happened. And uh, so three of those were uh, profitable sales, companies were sold, uh, and the other uh, four were uh, problems. And uh, we either sold them for a loss or we shut them down. And uh, then we still have eight companies active in the portfolio. And, uh, and so I'll tell you what the three outcomes were and a little bit about the, the other companies. So I'll watch the time here. So we've had three companies sold. The first one was sold in 2008. It was called Ribbit. And it was kind of a voicemail company. It was kind of like a telecoms as a service company where you could have a telephone service that was virtualized and on the internet. 
And uh, before we got to market British te uh, Telecom, now known as BT, it was a brilliant renaming exercise by, uh, by this big uh, British telecoms company that they figured nobody would know they were British if they just called it BT. So uh, they bought Ribbit for $105 million. And uh, we made $25 million off of that sale on behalf of our investors. We actually didn't give it all back to them, but that's another story. Uh, and then we had the first security company we invested in was sold in 2010. NetWitness for $250 million to EMC, uh, a big storage and security company. Um, and, uh, and so we earned $40 million out of that company. Uh, and then we had another company called Social Cam that actually spun out of one of our companies, uh, formerly known as Justin TV. Uh, and Social Cam, we put $500,000 into it in January of 2012. And in June of 2012, it was sold for $60 million. So we got $15 million, $16 million back in six months. The, the guys who were pitching, they know that, they understood that, they got that right away. So if you add up the numbers there, uh, that's a $79 million total that we've sold these companies for, which is more than the money we raised in the fund. So we've already earned more than the money we've raised. And that's a good sign. People like that if you start making money. So then we have four companies left in the portfolio, and I'm just going to tell you about one of them, because it's mine, and I can do that. So the one uh, which is down here in the slide is called Twitch. And Twitch is the game over dominant company in what's known as eSports. How many people play video games more than once a day? Boy, you guys are serious. Used to. <laughs> used to? OK, how many used to? At some point played video games. So there we go. That's better. Nobody wants to admit they're still doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I got gotcha. you. So uh, uh, Twitch is in this category called eSports. And eSports is turning video games into a spectator sport. Now, I don't play video games myself, I swear. I really don't. Um, I play Words with Friends, but that's not a video game. Uh, and, but these are people that actually like to watch other people playing video games. It's a really interesting phenomena. And Twitch is growing really fast. Uh, and in fact, its primary competitor went out of business a month ago. And uh, so this is a company that's doing very well. And it raised money from another investor called Bessemer Venture Partners, which is big and legitimate and valid, unlike us. And because they invested in the company, the valuation put on that company is considered valid by other investors. So uh, I go to twitch.tv uh, at some point, not right now because I'm talking, um, and, uh, and look at it. The very first screen that shows up, you'll watch somebody playing a video game with a voiceover. They're describing what they're doing, and then there's a chat screen on the right uh, where people talk about what the guy's doing. And uh, if you do play video games, it means you can solve video games much faster. Instead of taking 30 hours to solve a video game, you can take 15 hours to solve a vi video game, particular one. So that's one of four companies that we have in the portfolio. So what we're saying is that we're going to make more than 2x on our investment. In other words, we've already made 1x. We're going to make another x uh, out of these companies. So most of them go, yeah, yeah, that's valid. And then we have some upside. Maybe these companies will do better than we think they'll do. And maybe we can make 3x. But we're not saying that right now. We're just saying 2x. Well, this year, 2006, that we raised this fund, that makes us one of the best funds in the business. So that's good. So we go from there to the second fund. And this is where WaveConnect shows up. So, uh, so uh, now this is a fund that we raised three years ago. We closed it in 2010 uh, and uh, uh, started investing in the beginning of 2010. And so we've invested in a total of 22 companies. We have 18 that are our core portfolio investments. The other four we did for other reasons. There are small amounts of money. So uh, we have 18 companies in this portfolio. And we've been trying to figure out how to explain to people, you know, this is going to be a good portfolio because we don't have any results. The, we've all, all we've done so far is lose money, actually. The value of the portfolio, all the companies, is the same as it was when we bought into them. Uh, but we charge fees to our investors. So we're paying ourselves and paying for our rent. And we don't pay ourselves very much, really, I swear. Um, and uh, so uh, we're, the cost of operating the firm is charged back to the investors. And that makes us lose money until we start making money more than the fees we're charging. So uh, right now, we show a negative return on investment. And uh, uh, again, go back to the thing I was telling you about. Just trust me. It's cool. It's OK. <laughs> we are going to make money. And here's why. We have three companies in this portfolio, each of which we think can be a fund maker. And when you say fund maker, uh, as a venture capitalist, 
you're talking bubbles. You're talking companies that are extraordinarily valuable. You're talking about companies that have valuations of more than a billion dollars. And that's what we're <coughs> all about, is creating companies like that. Um, so I'll just do Wave Connects, because it's fun. And uh, it was born here. Can I say it was born here at UCLA? Totally born here. Totally born here. So part of uh, CNSI, the lab, is a semiconductor facility which is capable of spinning chips. And when you're an investor and you want to invest in a chip company, the, the reason you don't is because it's so expensive to do spins of chips, to develop a chip and then test it out and make sure it works. Whoops. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so uh, there's this lab, and I'm going to go tour it and find out what the truth about this is. But apparently the, the, the founder of uh, TSMC, which is the world's largest fabrication, <coughs> chip, chip fabrication company, um, uh, provides this as a free service to startups. And, uh, we found this company through, and it's Bryce, right? Bryce. Bryce here, I keep pointing to him. He took my partner through UCLA a year and a half ago, and my partner found this company. Uh, Bryce showed him this company. My partner invested in Bryce's company previously, so he likes him. I did get a case of wine out of it. You did get a case? Wow. <laughs> uh, did he, he didn't ask me to pick it. Was it any good? No, 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 Ira. Ira oh, Ira did, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, well, that's interesting. Um, because you know he's not with the company anymore. Um, so uh, what WaveConnects does is it builds a chipset for uh, devices like this. And uh, what it's capable of doing, what this chipset is capable of doing, is transferring both power and data very fast. So power is a big problem for these devices because batteries run out of power, and so you have to recharge them. So part of the problem of buying these devices is thinking about how long the batteries last and so on and so forth. Uh, but then you also have to get stuff in and out of them, data in and out of them. And uh, right now, you have to have uh, connectors to do that, physical connectors that plug into the device. Um, and, and here's the story, and this is mixed company, so don't, don't quote me on this. Oh, wait a minute, this I'm being filmed. Okay. So all of you out there in video land, excuse me in advance for what I'm about to say. Um, there's this phenomenon where guys, when they are going to the bathroom, are standing in front of the toilet. I don't think there was anything wrong in saying that. And some guys will sit there with their phone doing their email while they're doing this. And some guys, including me, will drop their phone. And I did. So I fished my phone out of the toilet bowl, and I went running down to the Apple store. And uh, I walked in the Apple store, and I said, I dropped my phone in the water. What do I do? And the guy said, where? And I said, what do you mean, where? He said, where'd you drop the phone in the water? And I said, in the bathroom. And he said, oh, before or after? <laughs> It's a significant thing to know if you're about to pick the phone up. So he didn't believe me. So he put on a, one of those uh, medical gloves, and he picked the phone up and dropped it in a plastic baggie, and he closed the baggie, and he put it away, and he said, okay, now we can help you out. And what you need to know about that is that Apple is a huge company. It sold tens of millions of these things, and that problem, that specific problem, happens so frequently that there's somebody at the top ranks of Apple management had to figure out the script and train every Apple genius in every Apple store worldwide how to respond when somebody comes in and says, I just dropped my phone in the water. And down to the level of detail of before or after. Um, so uh, the reason that's a problem is because these things have connectors and there have to be holes in the case and you can't waterproof them. Uh, well, you will be with, with Wave Connects. So what WaveConnect does is it has a chipset, and on either side of the connection, the chips are capable of delivering or transferring both power and data. The power part actually comes after the, the lab. It's a new thing that's been put in since then. The, uh, so for a 90 cent, I believe it's 90 cent a piece chip, the smartphone maker can seal the case so that no longer is a problem, and water can't get inside and, and destroy the, the electronics. But they can also transfer data faster than USB current USB, and the USB port on uh, these Macs and computers is USB 2. USB 3 transfers data so fast that uh, uh, you know how in the Verizon commercials they do this, uh, you know, tap two phones together and you can transfer a picture of a short video or something like that. Uh, with this uh, chipset, which is near field communications, the, uh, you'll be able to tap these things and transfer a whole movie, a whole feature length -like movie in, uh, like that. So uh, this is really fast. So the smartphone makers are really, really into this chipset. And this is a company that figured out how to do it and protect it. And in fact, Intel Capital had a project to develop a similar chipset that failed. The project failed. So Intel Capital less, led the last round of financing, I assume you know this, um, on the company at a 
moderately increased valuation. I thought it should have been higher. Um, and uh, uh, so Intel obviously can evaluate that this is a really excellent opportunity. And it's an opportunity to disrupt a business that exists today that does tens of billions of dollars of revenue, and that's the physical connector business. The people that make those connectors that uh, Apple uses, but are on televisions and cars and all over every product we use. And uh, the biggest standalone company right now in that business is called Molex and is currently valued at $5 billion. And they're actually not the biggest entity. 3M is the biggest entity, but they do it as a division, so you can't break it out. So we have a company, a little company, just raised its uh, third round of financing, uh, where we own a significant percentage. So you can imagine when I'm uh, pitching the investors, that's just one of three. It's kind of like, it chops, it slices, it dices. So we have two others. I won't tell you about them here because I'm running out of time. Yeah, I won't tell you about that either. I'll get into the uh, team. And what I'm aiming for is the last slide, and the last slide's very relevant to you because you, you're going to help me out uh, ultimately. So uh, pay attention. So I'm Stuart Alsop. You just heard my background. Um, and I'm the Alsop and Alsop Louis. I'm the gadfly. And then my first partner is Gilman Louis, the Louis and Alsop Louis who previously ran uh, Inkytel for six years, the CIA's venture capital fund, but before that was an entrepreneur in the video game business. And so some people do stop and go, well, why did the CIA hire a guy from the video game business to run their venture capital firm? And uh, it makes sense, because if you think about it, the CIA is actually just a really big video game. It just has no off button. And uh, it goes 7 by 24 constantly, and the people that are playing are playing with their lives and you know, whole countries. So, uh, so the connection between starting a video game company and the CIA was actually uh, pretty relevant, and it turned out to work, work pretty well. Um, yeah, so that's, that's Gilman. So we're bringing in a new general partner into the, fund, into the firm with this fund, and his name is Bill Kroll. He's the spook. And he spent 20 years working with the National Security Agency. He also stepped out for a while to run a public company, so he's a unique individual in the sense that he knows how to operate inside the government and be a successful executive in a commercial company. But he also has a very peculiar, not peculiar, special talent to us of being an amazing mentor to entrepreneurs. He brings entrepreneurs along in a way that, that we have difficulty doing, so uh, he's a major addition to our team. And then we have, of course, the Bean Counter, who is our CFO. Um, and I have meetings with Nancy. Nancy Lee is our CFO. She is approximately five foot one, so I have to sit down to have meetings with her. Why nobody went for that one. <laughs> so, and then we have three other partners. Um, Bill Coleman was a guy who started a company. You guys are also young, with a few exceptions. Um, this is a company that was started in 1994 called BEA Systems. He'd worked at Sun Microsystems previously, and bef from founding to when he gave up the CEO job, he, it was a $20 billion company. Uh, it was the fastest software company to ever reach a billion dollars of revenue. And uh, so he's got a pretty accomplished entrepreneur. And then started another company, didn't do so well, but we won't mention that. Um, and he's actually stepped in and running one of our portfolio companies right now called Resilient Networks, which is one of our uh, fund making companies. And uh, Jim Williams, who we call Mr. Gadget, is our consumer electronics executive who is the project manager on WaveConnects, the board member who has put together a remarkable board of directors uh, for WaveConnects, the chairman of which is a guy named Don Tony Fidel. Tony Fidel, let's see, let me hook it all the way back up here. Jim was an investor in a different firm back in the 90s when he invested in a company called Portal Player. Portal Player was a component company, kind of like WaveConnects, it had chips, but it had a bunch of other stuff, which would allow you to build a hard disk-based music player. And people thought it was crazy that he invested in this company. You know, an OEM company, in other words, a company that sold components to other companies, would require a major design win to be successful, while their major design win was the iPod, which Apple sold to quite a few of. And so Portal Player became a public company and was worth billions of dollars, and Jim made an incredible amount of money out of that. But the key thing is that that was Apple, and he's the only investor in Silicon Valley who actually can call up Apple executives uh, and have them return this call. And uh, one of those is Tony Fidel, who was the product manager for iPod, and then the general manager of the iPhone division at Apple, and now is the CEO and founder of a company called Nest, which is the company with the, the thermostat with the user interface. And uh, so Jim uh, recruited Tony to be chairman of the board, and Tony told the company how to go into Apple, 
I can't go any further than that. They went into Apple, it's as far as I can say. In fact, I've started observing to people that, uh, that there's a competition between Gilman's relationship with the CIA and Jim's relationship with Apple about whether the CIA or Apple are more secretive. Um, <laughs> got that one, that's good. And then Joe Adiego, who is a fellow who comes out of the embedded systems business, which is like a complex technical business, and he knows what he's talking about. So here's the, it's pretty good. Here's the thing. This is where you're gonna help me out. We have a program we call the Campus Associate Program. You too can be a venture capitalist. So, uh, so it's good that I gave you this pitch and showed you what it's like to be a venture capitalist because we hire, we hire part-time students on campus. We like to get to them when they're sophomore years so that we can work with them over a period of two to three years before they graduate. Now we hire them to spy for us on campus. And uh, generally speaking, what we found is when we hire this individual, um, they're already doing everything that we're hiring them to do, so there's no extra workload. Um, we just pay you some money, and then you call into our partners meeting every week, and you tell us what's going on on campus. So we have five of these right now. Uh, one at UT Austin, a guy named Michael Achillian. One at Stanford, a lady named Ernestine Fu. Uh, there's a little story behind that, and I'll tell that in a second. A guy at Berkeley, our third guy at Berkeley, uh, Rohit Turmella, uh, who's a double, double major in electrical engineering and computer science. He's a geek. Um, in fact, we've discovered that our students are like us. They're either geeks or gadflies. And uh, so Michael and Rohit and Romy are geeks, and Ernestine and Alex are gadflies. Uh, Alex is a student at USC, uh, and uh, we list him as an author and a blogger. That's because we can't figure out what actually he does. But he has been signed up by Crown Publishing to write a business book, and they claim him to be the youngest business author they've ever contracted. And uh, so he's uh, preternatural. Yeah, he does wander around the campus at UCLA, so watch out, because um, he'll tackle you. And then we have a fellow named Romy Kadri at uh, MIT, who, uh, whose degree is in innovation engineering. And he's taken, taken it upon himself to, as a personal mission to make uh, students at MIT seem less like geeks, which is a big mission. It's a real, it's an important, something important to do. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Ernestine. Is when we started this program, we started at Berkeley. We're based in San Francisco, and you can go south to Stanford, you can go across the bridge to Berkeley, and we're sitting there going, there's 200 venture capitalists on Sand Hill Road, which is right above the Stanford campus, and they're all wandering around looking for the next Larry and Sergey, who are the founders of Google, uh, if you didn't know. And so they're all over campus, and we said, there's no way, we'd have to drive like 30 minutes to get down there, we can't possibly compete with them, we'll go to Berkeley, because nobody pays attention to Berkeley, these UCs, you know. Um, it's all part of the UC network and nothing actually happens over there. So, uh, so we went over there and we recruited a guy um, to be our first campus associate who, by the way, it happens to be the CEO of one of our companies, uh, one of our fund making companies in Fund One. Uh, and he recruited another guy after he left who is now the CEO of a company in Fund Two. We like to bring people along and keep them in the portfolio. <coughs> so, uh, so we had Berkeley nailed. Uh, but I happened to be, I went to a social event at, uh, at Stanford uh, one evening, a couple of years ago, and Ernestine came up to me and tackled me and uh, said, I hear you're a venture capitalist and I want to I know about this venture capital thing. Well, Ernestine is a remarkable young lady and uh, so we decided to bring her in as a campus associate even though she has a, she's working on a degree in c civil engineering. Well, it actually turns out she's working on two degrees in civil engineering. She graduates uh, this year with a bachelor's and a master's in uh, civil engineering and has an opportunity to stick around for her PhD at Stanford. And we're, she's trying to figure out if that's what she really wants to do with her life. Um, so we brought her in. Uh, she sourced a deal immediately called JetLore, which is two PhD candidates from Stanford doing research into search. <laughs> Not that that's exactly what Google looked like at one point. Um, they're doing it into social search, which is a whole different thing. And then uh, shortly after that, she was put on the cover of Forbes magazine uh, as the youngest woman venture capitalist in the history of mankind. And, uh, so, and that's where Alex Founder was on the cover of Forbes. So he went and took off after her and got a, worked his way in as, uh, as a campus associate at USC. Uh, in any case, um, Alex has until 2014 before he graduates. Uh, so he's got another year, year plus uh, at USC. Um, but we definitely are interested in having a campus associate on the UCLA campus. Uh, Jim seems to think that there's no other campus worthy of such representation in the, in the south, in Southern California. 
well, I went to one of them, so <laughs> I'd have to agree about that one. But the, uh, uh, so anyway, that's, uh, that's the fund. <laughs> Stunned silence. <laughs> Yeah. I, I'm happy to entertain questions. In fact, if you want to just yell at me, it's okay, too. So I, just, I have two questions. One is, do you normally do lead or do you do fill in the rounds? We only lead. In fact, we don't like other investors. Um, right. we're, uh, we're, uh, pe we're peculiar. And one of the reactions we get when I give that pitch to, from people that are used to getting pitches is, wow, that sounds different. We don't like other investors. Uh, we like to buy as much of a company as we can get. Uh, we're preternatural in the way that we work with companies. If you're not good enough, we'll take you out. Um, we'll bring somebody else in. We're all about making money. We make this clear to our entrepreneurs that the whole point of the exercise is to build really great companies and make a lot of money at them. So, uh, so because we're a very early stage investor, the period of time between the founding of a company and the time when it gets into the market and has customers in a real business is the hardest time. It's the most difficult thing to pull off. And we found other investors aren't as good as we are. Maybe we're just arrogant or whatever, but, but we have an opinion about ourselves. So we actually prefer not to have any other investors in the company until we get it to that point. Now, WaveConnects was actually seeded by another investor, so we've had to drag him along with us, but you know. <laughs> we're talking about uh, the next internet. Is that time for UCLA's project internet too? I'm sorry, say the question again? We're talking about the next internet. Yeah. Is that time for UCLA's project internet too? Uh, well, I don't know what the project is, so I'd have to find out. High speed internet. High speed internet on campus, I mean, or in a generalized. Name. Okay. Um, I want to know more about it. Okay. So, a lot of VC's money is shifting away from consumer and kind of into enterprise. Do you think that's like a temporary shift because things in consumer have gone too bubbly, or is it, are there like more fundamental reasons behind that? So uh, this is a little bit of our attitude about venture capital, and, and I apologize to any other venture capitalists that happen to be in the room. Are there any other VCs in the room? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> keep them away. It's like, yeah. Um, uh, when you're watching the shifts of money in the venture capital business, you're talking about the vast majority of the dollars in the venture capital business. When you're talking about the vast majority of the dollars in the venture capital business, you're talking about the big venture capital firms. I don't believe there are venture capitalists anymore. They're really <coughs> early stage private equity firms that are looking for proven concepts where they can invest in companies that are growing really fast. So they're all about momentum investing. They're looking for things that are already happening and investing in them. Um, and you'll hear entrepreneurs complain about this all the time. If they go up and down Sand Hill Road, they go, well, you just come back when you have a million customers or a million dollars of revenue. You go, well, 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 so what do I do? <laughs> How do I get there? Um, entrepreneurs say that. And, uh, uh, so when, you, when venture capital, you can't look at the majority. You have to look at the edge. You have to look around the, the, the sides to understand what's going on. So by the time those investors are thinking the consumer is not a good thing to invest in, um, it's not the next shift you have to look at. It's several shifts over. So the enterprise is also over-invested and overvalued. At the same time that uh, Instagram was sold to Facebook for a billion dollars, Yammer, which is an enterprise company, was sold to Microsoft for a billion dollars. Both transactions happen within months of each other. So, and that's the Yammer thing is the consumerization of the enterprise. So uh, those things happened in parallel. Uh, so it's not shifting from consumer to enterprise. In fact, it's not clear what it's shifting to. And there's a good likelihood that there'll be another implosion in venture capital over the next five years, which is welcome actually, because uh, these big funds are really not producing returns and it's making the whole venture capital business look bad. And uh, so, um, so I'd have a hard time predicting what those guys will be doing until our bubble starts in 2015 and then they'll be funding our companies at $600 million and we'll be making lots and lots of money, which is part of the thesis that we have. By implosion, do you mean like contraction? Yeah, just the amount of the supply of capital will go down. Um, uh, there's, the funny thing is that we're going around and pitching, so we're talking to all the institutional investors who invest in venture capital funds and uh, they're still very excited about venture capital because even Zynga at $2 billion is a major increase in the value from the Series A investment at, you know, whatever it was, $20 million. Um, so even if what people consider a failure with either Groupon or Zynga still looks like a really great return. So the VCs are passing through um, stock that's worth a lot more than they paid for it. And the, the LPs, what we call them, the LPs are benefiting from that. So they're still feeling very happy about venture capital. 
the really good LPs are not looking at what returns they're getting right now, they're looking at what returns they'll be getting five years from now. But funnily enough, they don't understand that and they react to whatever they've been getting recently. So they're actively investing, which we like because it's easier for us to raise money until we fully establish that we have these three fund makers and we'll be making billions of dollars, at which time I keep telling them, if you come back to me in fund four, I'm gonna be arrogant and I'm gonna, I'm gonna diss you. So I won't need your money then, so you wanna invest now. Of course, they hear that and they go, God, this guy's an asshole. Good question there. You guys got out of social cam and it seemed obviously a great return for your fund. Do um, you think that the social video space has kind of moved on now with like Twitter with Vine? Like, I feel like it's going to be very difficult for any other company to come in or ones that are still around to exit. Well, the video space is really interesting and we still have this company called Twitch, which is still a live streaming platform. It's found this particular application in eSports that's, that's working really well. Someone observed to me uh, who was running a video company that uh, since YouTube, there's been no company that has exited or been valued at more than $100 million in the video space, regardless of whether it's social or web video. And uh, it's almost as though YouTube was so successful it just sucked the life out of the business for anybody else. Um, and you know the fact that Google paid $1.7 billion for them is a true indicator of the value that they actually got out of that company and, and have, have turned into a, a profitable revenue stream since. The, uh, so you have to say, well, it, you can't just put a video on the web, that's not good enough. You can't say that, oh, we're just gonna put a particular kind of video on the web, that's not good enough. You can't just say that you're gonna make it easy to make video on, a, on an iPhone and that's good enough. So there hasn't really been a proposition around video that's been novel for a number of years. And, but I'll tell you, there's still plenty of companies out there pitching it because uh, because we did Twitch and Social Cam, we get to see all the video companies that are being started up. So I think it's really a delta between when YouTube happened and the subsequent events to when somebody comes up with something really novel. Uh, people are talking about Vine right now, you know, six second videos. God, you can't do anything in six seconds with a video. It's like, uh, that's just boring. And that was like, okay, well, they did 140 characters for Twitter, so if you're gonna do video, you have to do, well, I remember this, because we talked about it at Social Cam, and we never capped the video. At Social Cam, you can run it as long as you wanted. Uh, Viddy was doing, I think it was three minute videos or something like that. They capped it at three or four minutes. Um, now Vine's doing it for six seconds. It's like, nah, it's not how video works. It's not, not the right thing. So just doing that isn't good enough. You have to be really, you have to really think through the problem. And I don't think, I don't think the entrepreneurs have gotten far enough along. But if you know a company, don't talk to anybody else. Hi, um, my name is London. I'm actually not a student at UCLA. Um, I actually is that legal? I mean, you guys let them in? It's like. Uh, I actually attend San Monica College. Uh huh. San Monica College has a culture for sustainable practices. They have a, uh -huh. a center for environmental urban studies, and also they just built a new bike rack behind the school. But one thing I noticed after being there for two years so far is they don't have a culture for entrep entrepreneurism. Uh -huh. And so I'm trying to start a club for that, a startup club. And so I was wondering after, you know, after saying that if you would be interested in working for a campus associates at SMC too. So uh, probably not. Um, and uh, uh, this is just being direct. Because there's no culture for entrepreneurship, there's no track record for entrepreneurship, there's nothing that we can kind of hook into that will provide what we're looking for. Uh, even with UCLA, I mean, uh, I started off that way being obnoxious, but you know, that's the, the rep on UCLA is you go there to learn how to make films or be a doctor or both. And uh, um, <laughs> it doesn't have a huge track record for producing entrepreneurs. Now, Jim here started three companies, but he's a professor and keeps coming back and teaching. So I don't know if that's a good model. And there's this other guy I met who's not here that started one company and has got another one going. And, you know, that has to build up. And so th that's what we're, we're looking for is that it's already proven as opposed to got the potential. <laughs> yeah, there is that. <laughs> um, you were talking about, you know, major shift in technology and the ability to forecast and, you know, technology cycle. You know, it, it, there's always that, that curve, right? It's about recognizing it at a certain point in time before everybody else do that. And is there any guidance or how do you do that? Uh, well, it's a secret, so I can't tell you. Um, <laughs> And that's because I really don't know. Um, the, uh, there's this thing, and I, you know, it comes back to actually having enough experience and having a confidence and the ability to tell that you just, it's like a sixth sense. So when we started sitting around in 2008, 2009, 
talking about this Evernet thing and how technology shifts are going, we basically just said, look, it's been 15 years since the internet. Okay, it was 15 years between client server and the internet, and it was 15 years between you know the, my, the uh, mini computer and the, and the PC. So it's like happens every 15 years. So something's gotta be happening, so what is it? So we went looking for it, and then we found this thing, and Gilman found this, which he knew and other people did, but not very many, that we were running out of IPv4 addresses. There was a, you know, IPv4 is a namespace that has eight digits in it, and you can do the math, and you come up with a certain number of unique addresses, and they, were, they let out the last ones in 2011. There are no more new IP, IPv4 addresses. Now it's become a marketplace where you can buy and sell them and exchange them, and there's a value associated with them, and blah, blah, blah. But, it, but he said, well, what, well, what about IPv6, which is the next standard? Much bigger namespace and much better. It's more reliable architecture, and you can scale it. So you can see where we got the whole pitch from, and we developed it over time. But it just started with, well, we've been around long enough to see it last about 15 years, so what's going on? Go look for it. Um, and then you kind of make it up. <laughs> so uh, we just made it up, and you know, if it's true at some point and people start calling it the Evernet, we'll be the author of the Evernet. I mean, my God, we'll be like Chris Cerf or something like that. It's, uh, we'll be famous guys, plus we'll make a lot of money. That probably wasn't a very good answer, but. You're going to answer? I think we're short on time. Maybe yeah. one last question. You got it. How do you pick your entrepreneurs? How do we pay our? How do you pick them? Oh, pick them. Yeah. Boy, great question. We're struggling with that right now, actually. It's, a, it's the kind of primary issue we have right now. We've made a lot of mistakes in picking entrepreneurs. And it's because as an investor, you're sitting there and you get excited about an idea. <laughs> and there's this uh, phrase that I heard from another investor called uni. Well, I like uni. Uni is the squishy yellow stuff that they serve in sushi restaurants. Um, uh, but this is the acronym Uni, which means user, not investor. So when you're looking at a deal and an entrepreneur is pitching you on something, you get all excited about it, you gotta say to yourself, is that because you wanna use it or because you wanna make money on it? And uh, an investor's job is to make money. And so if you're really focused on making money, you've gotta be sitting in front of somebody who uh, can do that for you, because you don't do it yourself as the investor. Investors help, they don't actually do. So um, we've had a lot of experience with entrepreneurs who were too short-sighted or were passive-aggressive or we haven't really found any dishonest ones, um, but intellectually dishonest or emotionally dishonest. So I mean, you really have to become a psychologist to try to figure out whether somebody's capable of doing this. So I'll leave you, I'll push the time limit a little bit. I'll leave you with the Silicon Valley asshole theory, <coughs> which I've rarely done in public because it involves using a bad word. Um, but the Silicon Valley asshole theory is a thing that I figured out back in the, 80, uh, back in the 80s. I started a newsletter in 85 and I came up with this in 1987, which is a, I'm a pattern recognizer. And so I recognize this pattern. There's certain people that start a company, you know, from the ground up, uh, often napkin, uh, who are still CEO of that company when it has more than a billion dollars of revenue. Oh, these are pretty interesting people, you know, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Larry Ellison, Jeff Bezos now, uh, you know, you can go through, you can find a fair number of them. Um, and uh, so I said to myself, well, what makes these guys the same? So you line them all up against the wall and you go, well, they're all assholes. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it's funny, but actually there's a, a kernel of truth to it because as you're going through your life and you're deciding what you want to do, if you really have a mission, you're probably gonna rank that mission higher than other things, like family, you know. I don't think you can put honesty in there, but you know, there's these edgy cases where you know, your, your, your daughter's gonna go in the AYSO and she's gonna play in a championship team, but your company's going public. Which one do you go to? Uh, well, the company going public obviously is more important. The kid can take care of herself. The, uh, you know, a lot of people hear that and go, well, that guy's an asshole. That's what I meant by that. It's like, uh, you know, he chooses his business over his family or he chooses, you know, whatever choices you make as you're going through. So you think of a guy like Steve Jobs or Bill Gates. I mean, they were completely focused on making these monster companies that were huge game changers that provided all kinds of other benefits. But, you know, along the way, there were a lot of people who felt like they were really assholes. And Michael Dell at Dell Computers, actually a really nice guy. But uh, anyway, so I've developed that. I can. I can spend an hour and a half on the asshole theory. <laughs> but thank you very much. <laughs>